Okay, Chair Rubin, you may begin. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Lael Rubin. I'm chair of the Civilian Oversight Commission. Also with us this evening is our vice chair, Casmiro Tolentino. Welcome to today's Civilian Oversight Commission's virtual community listening session, Reflections on the Criminal Justice System. All too often when we turn on the news, there is a story about yet another shooting, another death, or another use of force against a black or a brown person. The cumulative toll of these horrific interactions has caused all of us collective trauma. And we need to find a way to begin to deal with this trauma. Tonight, we honor the lives of those known and unknown members of our communities who have lost their lives because of violence. Tonight's town hall is designed to lift up your voices and create a space for leaders and community members to share our observations and suggestions, and hopefully a chance to begin a collective healing process. Tonight, we have designed this space for you to share your thoughts and to gain some insight into how to respond and heal from the collective trauma we are all experiencing. The Commission wants to offer its support to you as we all process our responses to the Chauvin verdict and other law enforcement events. We want to hear from each of you. If you're posting or tweeting during tonight's town hall, feel free to tag us on social media at LA County COC. This evening, we have a panel of speakers who will share their thoughts and who will briefly offer suggestions on how we can deal with our community trauma. Then we will spend the bulk of the time hearing from you. Tonight, our guests are Wendy Bianco, Director of Counseling Services uh, and Trauma Recovery at Peace Over Violence. Robin Toma, Executive Director of the Human Relations Commission for Los Angeles County. Pierre Ariola, Senior Human Relations Consultant at the Human Relations Commission. And Pastor V. Jesse Smith from the Way Center of Truth. When it's time for live comments, as a reminder, you'll need to be logged into WebEx. If you're watching on Facebook or listening over the phone, you'll not be able to provide live remarks. The WebEx login information can be found on the Commission's website at coc.lacounty.gov. For those logged into WebEx, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand in the participant window to get in queue. You can also use the chat box to message the host. We have had more than 140 registering community members, and we want to make sure to appropriately hear from members of the public. So we will um, only uh, allow two minutes, um, a maximum of two minutes per community speaker. I know that's not enough, but we all want to make sure to hear from everybody who has expressed an interest in speaking and expressing their thoughts. And now I leave you with our first speaker, Wendy Bianco, Director of Counseling Services and Trauma Recovery at Peace Over Violence. Thank you, Wendy. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here for the second time with the COC um, and focusing on trauma. I am, once again, uh, the Director of Counseling Services and Trauma Recovery for a local organization, uh, Peace Over Violence. So we focus a lot of our attention on survivors of trauma, more so tra uh, trauma survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, but with everything that has happened, I think this year has been really heavy for everyone. And as a leading agency focusing on trauma, you know, I'm here to provide um, some insight on ways that we can, one, identify trauma within ourselves, our bodies, 
and even in our communities, right? How we, you know, the behavior or the symptoms, I should say, of trauma are very visceral. And so I'll be here with you all today to talk about trauma symptoms, what they look like, and then ways that we can collectively take care of ourselves and others um, while also um, taking action, right? And doing something to, to heal our communities. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I'd like to pass it over to Robin. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I too am really um, pleased that I can join uh, this, the uh, LA Sheriff's Civilian Oversight Commission and want to thank Chair Rubin along with uh, Executive Director Brian Williams for the, um, this opportunity as well as our partnership um, in working with community on this important issue. Um, you know, our, our Commission on Human Relations uh, really uh, is so dedicated to this issue that it is one of our strategic priorities. Uh, we recognize that the relationship between police and uh, community is so critical um, because we give such tremendous power to the police in the ability to use legally force. And we have seen the damage it does in our communities when there is a lack of trust with the police. So. We made it a priority to uh, work to increase uh, equity and fairness in our county's criminal justice systems. And we set up a committee uh, that would be dedicated to involving many of our active commissioners and uh, staff to the goal of bringing about changes in policies and practices that would increase fairness and equity uh, in policing in our county. And uh, we spent about five years of meeting with community organizations and leaders in each of the five uh, supervisorial districts in our county, from Antelope Valley to, to Long Beach, from uh, San Fernando Valley to South LA. Um, and we also met with law enforcement uh, agency leadership. And through that process, we produced a report called Redefining Policing with Our Community, which has 34 recommendations that we're now working to implement. And I invite you to take a look at that or our video uh, about it at uh, www.lahumanrelations.org. Um, and we dedicated all this time because we know that in this moment, we are really um, at a critical uh, um, point in our development as a society, as, an, as a county community. Um, we recognize that um, when we don't have healthy relationships between law enforcement and the community, um, it is incredibly uh, damaging. It's incredibly inhibiting to really um, protecting the basic human rights of everyone and ensuring that we can have an opportunity to live uh, to our fullest and live in thriving communities that are free of prejudice and inequity. And that's, that's part of our, our mantra as a, the department uh, vision statement is, and I think this applies to all of us that when we are together, that we are an unstoppable force that uplifts and protects our most vulnerable and builds vibrant and thriving communities that are free of prejudice and inequity. Uh, so, you know, personally, I will tell you that um, I began the work uh, around policing issues over 30 years ago as a civil rights attorney. And uh, it was beginning with the issue of the death of Eula Love in the early 1990s. And then Rodney King happened. Um, and our commission actually is based in um, racial violence in, in the city of Los Angeles that involved um, uh, sailors and, and other military personnel who were um, going after uh, men of color in uh, zoot suits. You may have heard about the Broadway play, but this is the the actual events that occurred that really um, highlighted the uh, the racial fracturing in our in our society and the uh, the fact that police, you know, in in, in many cases, uh, stood by as um, uh, men of color, uh, Latinos and and others were uh, pulled out of streetcars, out of restaurants, out of movie theaters, and beaten uh, by groups of of um, mostly white uh, military uh, sailors that were off on leave. And so um, 
we know that that's part of our DNA and that we have to really um, carry out our, our principles of nonviolence and of justice to uh, build the kind of society that we know we can be. And so um, I really feel like this is a, an important historic moment for us as a community to begin to um, build on, you know, the, uh, I think, a victory for accountability that so many people feel and realize that um, this is such an important uh, uh, step for, for us um, and for the, not just the friends and family of George Floyd, but really because of what that has represented for all of our communities, uh, it's a milestone that, uh, that we can build from. And I think that um, what we want to see is that we don't let up here in terms of recognizing that there's so much work to do and that um, really we look to the engagement of the communities that has been so critical to bringing about changes to continue uh, in, in working with uh, government and working with um, uh, you know, all of the forces that uh, need to be involved in uh, bringing about the changes that are, are in many cases long overdue. And uh, I am just so pleased that on a personal level, having gone through the um, heartbreak of the verdicts in the Rodney King trial, the heartbreak of so many trials that uh, ended up with results that were far from justice um, to a place where uh, I can see that we are turning a corner and that uh, we have a lot of work to do to to strengthen the relationships of trust, to increase the work uh, and engagement of community uh, and forces to to play a larger role in public safety and the issues that underlie uh, the the kinds of uh, cases that we're seeing, and to build the kind of communities that we know we can, and that uh, we we can be in a place uh, 10 or 20 years from now when we're not looking back like we were after the 50th anniversary of the Watts uprising and say, has much changed? I know we've taken some huge steps already, but I'd love to see us in uh, not 50 years, but 10 years from now to be able to look back and say, we have got, come a long ways from where we've been. So uh, with that, I wanna um, pause there and tell you in advance, I'm sorry that I can't stay for the whole event, but I want to turn us uh, turn this over to uh, a senior member of our staff, Pierre Areola, uh, who has been a leader uh, in the work with our commissioners, with our staff, with the community um, in advancing equity in policing. And uh, he is going to, um, with his uh, beautiful skills and spirit, um, moderate this next part of the event to uh, allow all of you to um, share your concerns, uh, share your voices, and to uh, take us through the end of the event with our uh, final panelists. So with that, Pierre. Thank you, Robin, and I appreciate your words and your energy. Thank you for sharing that today. Before we get into uh, that section, I'm going to go ahead and volley it back over to Wendy Blanco, who's going to be leading us in a presentation around strategies for addressing trauma. After that, we'll get into moderating our listening session here today and hearing y'all's voices, thoughts, and opinions and reflections in regards to the current times. Thanks again, Robin. Wendy? I know I'm going to be sharing my my video or someone's going to be assist, assisting me in that, Jennifer. Yes, I'll be sharing the PowerPoint that you sent to me. Great, great. And so here really I'm going to be facilitating a conversation and really talking about trauma and community violence and how we can look at it in a different lens and just focus on how like impactful this all has been for us. And so again, my name is Wendy Blanco. I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Peace Over Violence. Um, and the next slide, we can go to the next one. So what I'm going to be talking about is really trauma, trauma in the sense of focusing it and focusing the, de the definition as it literally being a wound, a psychological 
wound that quickly becomes embedded in the body. So it's something that happens too quick or too much too soon. And so it starts to overwhelm our nervous system and we start to feel the sensations in our body. Um, some of the symptoms in the next slide. Oh, before I get into the symptoms, sorry, I'm going to go over like trauma and then thinking about trauma in not only just uh, trauma being like the big tra traumatic experiences that I think we're used to hearing about, but also thinking of trauma as collective trauma or chronic trauma. And these are the things that we see like a long history of experiencing racism, poverty, uh, oversaturation of information in the media. So we're living in a different time where we are constantly having access to uh, the news and, you know, the different type of news that is fed to us. So thinking about not only how the news constructs um, stories in such a way that can perpetuate, you know, uh, racism and um, and you know, even like different uh, colonialism and institutional racism and how we're looking at uh, media also as a way of like continuing to stigmatize certain conversations, certain like marginalized communities and keeping them, you know, in this corner, right? So I think when we think about trauma, I'm really talking today about collective trauma and how we're experiencing it over a long period of time. And in the next slide, we think about like how trauma starts to ex how we're experiencing trauma. So not only are we seeing trauma, um, you know, in the symptoms that we're used to thinking about, like depression and anxiety, but also like this disconnection. There tends to be a lack of empathy or over empathizing with um, other folks or other communities, right? So this disconnection is really important to think about, especially when we think about um, the way that it leads to uh, community violence, right? So there's already this uh, community that's marginalized, there's disconnection and how trauma affects us individually, you know, starts to affect us in a larger scale, starts to affect the disconnection in community. You know, a lot of the work that we do at piece of where violence is we're focusing on strengths and how to include the community building because we know that there's a lot of strength in cultural our cultural backgrounds you know we're not you know people of color tend to have cultures that are more collectivistic right where we unite together and that makes us stronger and so when we have you know symptoms of trauma where we're fearful of others or we feel distrust in you know, systems or distrust in our communities, we begin to isolate, right? The next slide. So what we know about ACEs also is really important. We know that, you know, adverse childhood experiences affects our, our health, our biological um, trajectory. So children or adults have, that have experienced four or more childhood adverse uh, uh, experiences are more likely to have uh, health issues. Um, they're more likely to have high blood pressure, um, heart issues. Uh, why? Because the way that trauma and stress is, uh, is sort of lives in our body, our body is trying to actively combat that. You know, it's a stress that lives in our body where we're always constantly in the fight or flight, you know, instinct. And our body really doesn't know what to do with that. In fact, it becomes toxic for our bodies to carry all of that stress. So ACEs has been a huge revelation, but also like a huge study that Kaiser did um, around, you know, noticing now like how like adverse childhood experiences really affect our ability to live healthier lives, you know, like our, it's not a secret that people of color are more affected by health issues. Um, and now we're linking it to stress and chronic stress over time. The next slide. So the other thing that's really important is, to, is knowing that like when Oh, the one before. Yeah, there we go. So community violence and PTSD. So thinking about how this all sort of manifests, how this all sort of becomes, um, uh, how we can sort of notice it in the lens of like 
how we deal with it individually. So these symptoms are definitely like, you know, in our body, we're showing signs of, you know, distrust, hypervigilance, hyperarousal. So constantly being, you know, checking for the exits, constantly being startled by loud sounds. So we think about how, you know, one on one it's affecting us. And so the first thing that, you know, that we need to do as a community is be supportive, right? Identify and help survivors of trauma and community violence, you know, having spaces, safe spaces where people can talk about um, these things. What has happened over time, though, is that there has been this distrust in services. So if you think about, you know, I think about, you know, um, uh, the migrant community, how they uh, are fearful to come to programs because they're historically, you know, they've been told that if they get free services, they have to pay them back or, you know, they're afraid of, you know, being deported or there's a lot of like fear around accessing services and free services of that, right? So there's already barriers that exist in access to care. Um, and then thinking about like relationship building, it's so important that when we think about collective care, we're thinking about individual care, but also as a community. It's important that we feel safe and supported um, in our communities and that we build, you know, relationships. You know, some of our communities of color are, you know, are far from their families or may not have family, a lot of family that they can access, right? We think about how, you know, families may be affected by, um, you know, multiple incarcerations in their family. So maybe they don't have access to like their immediate community. So building spaces where they can develop that trust and stability is really important, you know, and having like opportunities to developing skills, you know, in in the community, you know, having collective spaces, you know, they have them in you know, we're working with a group in Boston and a lot of the women have really rallied together in providing collective spaces to learn different trades. And then the trade that they learn, they sort of like, you know, they exchange if one, you know, makes clothing and the other one grows vegetables, they exchange those goods, right? So we're looking at ways that we can build community through mastery and learning skills and developing and then being and contributing to their community. And then, you know, in a community level, like understanding that there is importance in feeling safe. And in fact, you know, because what we know of trauma and we know that there is this fight, flight or freeze response that we innate, innately, you know, respond with and lead with. These are things that we have no control over, you know, and because we know that that happens, having an understanding of trauma and how it's manifesting in the body. And so someone running, how that might be a symptom of trauma, how that might be their fear, you know, that might be like a manifestation of their own experiences of being, of interacting with systems, right? And then societally on a larger level, thinking about how do we change the talk? You know, how do we change the cultural norms? How do we look at the ways that we're encouraging, you know, like this idea of toxic masculinity where you know, men don't talk about their feelings or how, you know, um, professions that are uh, male dominated are also like, you know, in this culture of, um, you know, hyper masculinity, right? And whatever that means, again, the toxic masculinity that is important to address even with young boys. So thinking about how do we change the expectations and how do we change the norms and the message to support the decrease in violence, right? When we talk about sexual assault survivors, you know, there is, or, or even if we go to like someone um, breaking into someone else's car, right? A lot of people talk about, you know, why didn't you lock it? You know, why did you? You know, why didn't you put your wallet under the seat so that they couldn't see it, right? And it's shifting the paradigm and thinking about, well, I shouldn't have to worry about, you know, leaving my wallet in the car, right? So it's like we're blaming, we tend to blame the victim because that is the culture that we have created. That is the life that we live in, right? So it's like now, so we always are like, well, what was she wearing? Uh, you know, why, what was in your car? Why didn't you lock it? You know, and so thinking about changing that norm and saying, okay, how can we create communities where there is, you know, an expectation that, you know, that I can be safe, right? The next slide. 
And so all this is really just to say that, you know, you know, how we can help as a collective, as you know, organizations coming together is making sure that we're providing trauma informed care and we're leading with that lens that everyone is carrying some type of trauma, including the systems, you know, the people that work in the systems that, you know, that we're fighting against or those that are, you know, system impacted, right? So we're looking at this framework as everyone is enduring trauma and how do we use that framework to provide, you know, access to care where we're not re-traumatizing community members, where we're not re-traumatizing the people that we're supposed to be serving, right? So understanding trauma and understanding like that, that education around trauma-informed care at all levels, right? That is the hope, the idea for, you know, that that is the goal that we have, that all of our systems will, you know, operate in a trauma-informed care lens so that we're all on the same page. Next slide. And then some of the things that we can do, you know, um, Elaine Miller Caress, who is the founder of Trauma Recovery Institute, um, you know, if you don't know about her, definitely Google her. Um, she talks a lot about community resiliency model. And really all this is to say that it's important that we look to our communities to inform us of what they need. It's important that we look at the strengths that communities already have and the resilience, um, but also like the ways that, you know, we get the feedback, not to ignore the feedback that we're getting, but how do we apply that? You know, how do we apply that in, in services? And sometimes, you know, we look at sort of the big picture, like the funding sources don't always know what people are doing on the ground. So in terms of service delivery, you know, and funding requirements, it's not always aligned. So thinking about that, like how do we create spaces where a community can lead and community can tell us, okay, this is what we need in our community, right? So just like crime survivors um, uh, have like their own like um, cohorts and their community comes together with leaders that really inform policy and inform, you know, um, community leaders and what they, you know, what kind of services they need and spaces where they can be safe and in, in disclosing information, right? Or or even processing uh, and healing circles. Um, and so CRIM is really focused on how do we take care of ourselves? How do we focus on some of the things that we already have in our capacity to do, like resourcing, grounding, uh, making sure that we are noticing what's happening in our body? You know, even when we hear a news story, you know, that, that you know, it doesn't need to happen to you for you to feel that know, that emotion, that pain, that hurt, right? So thinking about how the trauma is affecting our bodies. And in the next slide, you know, a quick tip is the, the help now strategy. So things that you can do quickly to just re, uh, you know, restabilize, right? So one thing really quickly is you can drink a glass of water or something and just notice, you know, how the liquid is sort of going down your body and just noticing um, how it's affecting your body is a way to just be present. You know, as they say, there's always with trauma, there's always this mind and body disconnection that happens when there is chronic trauma. There is this dis disconnection that happens between the body and the mind. And so in order to endure continuously endure more trauma, sometimes most times we start seeing people that have little connection to their body and how their body is responding. So it is important for us to reconnect with our body in ways that are simple, like drinking water, looking around the room and just noticing like the different colors that you see and noticing, you know, the different items, you know, name six colors in that room, you know, noticing the temperature in the room. So activating all of your five senses so that you're in your body. You know, we tend to think that we can think about two things or multitask, but really we can't. We can't think of two things at once. So making sure that we're focusing on getting back into our bodies is really important. Next slide. And then lastly is really just thinking about self-care and what does it look like? In what ways do you take care of yourself? So the quote here is you can't pour from an empty cup. So take care of yourself first. It's that idea of putting the oxygen mask on yourself first before you try to help others. It's really important, you know, that we are 
able to stabilize ourselves first in order to and not avoid really like we want to make sure that we're noticing what's happening with us first in order to you know provide that collective healing and that space for others next slide and then also acknowledging that there are like barriers. There are definitely cultural barriers to self care. Thinking about number one, is this, you know, our the way that we view things, like our capitalism, you know, actually encourages us to do more and doing more equals success, right? So thinking about how self care is a huge, a huge deal and it's hard to do because the, our society does not allow it. Right, we're told that we need to do more. We're not doing enough. That also our cultural norms about resting, like noticing, you know, how what re resting actually means to us. Does it make us feel like we're being lazy? Does it make us feel like we're wasting time? What are the messages that we're getting around self care? And then wondering, you know, what are some of the Western beliefs about self care? Even Western beliefs about therapy. Right, therapy is not going to be something that's helpful for everyone. People are going to you know, have feelings about that and it can be highly stigmatized. Therapy is stigmatizing a lot of cultures, right? So thinking about what makes it challenging for you to actually take care of yourself. The next slide. And these are some of my references. And then lastly, what I'll say is if you have any questions, um, if you want to talk more about like how trauma affects our communities, how like some of the work that we're doing um, to provide healing circles. Um, in the next slide, you'll have my email address. So feel free to reach out to me. Again, Peace Over Violence is a local organization, uh, both in the Metro LA area and also West San Gabriel Valley. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and energy in the space, Wendy. Really appreciate it. And I um, was curious uh, to really ask a question to see if we can. Uh, get some more understanding here. Um, I'm thinking, you know, right now at this moment in time, uh, there's been a fair amount of folks who have had that sustained organizing effort um, for this past year during the pandemic, throughout the pandemic, and even prior to that, um, especially when we're talking about criminal justice organizing and, and, and reform efforts and whatnot. And so I'm wondering with respect to that context, like for somebody who has been engaged in this workout in the trenches, uh, what advice might you have in terms of being able to uh, address their own collective trauma from those experiences as well? Yeah, I one of the things that I encourage um, is definitely creating spaces and community within those networks. You know, I know that I uh, recently became um, a part of the Latinx uh, Therapist Action Network, um, which is a group of, it's a collective for therapists, you know, with Latinx background. And we also not only do we come together and we're able to really process like how it's affecting us, but also we're able to bring efforts together in providing, you know, collective healing spaces voluntarily for communities of color, right? So I think that, you know, it is really important not to disconnect, to, to challenge ourselves not to be in this autopilot mode, but to continue to connect, even if sometimes it's hard to do that. You know, I think we get into these blinders of wanting to really um, either hyper focus on our clients because it feels like it's necessary to fight and fight, fight, right? But making sure that we're making time for ourselves to reconnect with the things that we love that make us whole, right? Like mm -hmm. making time for our families, making time for, you know, our own uh, interests and hobbies and our community efforts. Thank you for sharing that, Wendy. I have one last question for you here today too. Um, in the spirit of us really going deep today and you know, being vulnerable or sharing our own personal experiences to your comfort, I just wanted to uh, see if, if you had any insight that you'd like to share about a moment within this past year where your knowledge and your learnings on trauma informed care really helped you navigate uh, some of what you've collectively took on during this time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know that um, in this time, it's been a, a very busy time for therapists, um, particularly because, you know, in isolation, um, it has changed our world in terms of like how we 
um, are used to connecting with folks. I always tell people that this pandemic, not only was it uh, a routine killer, but there have been so many uh, monumental things that have happened in history you know, in this year. And I think one of the things that was very apparent was not having the safe brief spaces in order to, well, one, not having the spaces, but also not even having the bandwidth. It was like, if you're grieving one thing and the next thing you know, there's another thing. You're not even finished grieving the last thing when you're on to the next. And I think that was really hard to sit with. And what I learned is making sure that I remember not only, like I'm, I'm a person first, right? And as a therapist, I take on a lot but also recognizing when I needed to step back and I needed to take care of me. Thank you for sharing that, Wendy. And I think as, as uh, somebody who's out there um, in the trenches, it's really important to understand uh, not only your capacity, but your limitations at that point, right? And I think you're really calling to that. Um, and, and it's interesting that you bring that into the space too, because it's that's been a consistent conversation I've had with law enforcement on that end as well of them understanding officers, understanding and knowing, uh, understanding their trauma and the trauma that they're taking on and knowing when enough is enough and to remove themselves from certain situations uh, because their actions will then be carried with so much other baggage. So I, I think what you just suggested applies across the board uh, for us as organizers in the community, folks who are representatives in government, um, as well as folks out there in the field and then law enforcement too. I thank you for your comments and I know that you'll be imparting some additional wisdom as we move along here today and we bring in other folks. Um, I wanted to uh, go ahead and and uh, just highlight something um, as well on my end. I, I am seeing that there might be a, a housekeeping item uh, to bring on into the space as well as we get into our public comment. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to mention that you know, equity, accountability, transparency, transparency, and justice are all concepts that fall short of their meaning without trust. Um, I myself grew up in Pacoima in the 90s, and the story of the beating of Rodney King was a cautionary tale that was seared into my mind by our elders. It was a story that was weaponized and mechanized by our community to instill fear in children, a fear that would hopefully keep us away from the heavy hand of justice in the criminal justice system. I mean, it goes without saying that that was not a viable solution then, neither is it a viable solution now. Fear breeds distrust. Trust is central to our social cohesion and pads the social contract that we agree upon as members of our community. Without it, we experience breakdowns and things fall apart. Today, our goal is to build our responsibility to foster public trust and lead by following community. So I really want to uplift the leadership of the Civilian Oversight Commission and the partners here on this call here today who are taking that step forward to lead with vulnerability in mind, with community in mind, and with heart. We invite you today to share your thoughts, your opinions, your perspective, and most importantly, your energy as we work collectively together to carve a path forward towards justice in the County of LA. We recognize that the verdict was very much a step towards justice. It highlights accountability, but it is a step. It is not the end goal nor the end game right now. And that's something that we must definitely consistently work on. Our panelists, Wendy Blanco from Peace Over Violence and Pastor Jesse Smith from the Way Center of Truth will be here today to be able to respond to any community members needs um, or any requests that come from our speakers. Beyond that, Pastor Jesse Smith will also make his full remarks and close us out by providing some reflections. I wanted to offer some community guidelines too as we get into our conversation here today to hopefully ground us in some shared understanding. I wanted to uplift the fact that we have, uh, we are asking folks to stay within their time restrictions. There's two minutes of time and we're not really anticipating any interruptions being made um, unless it's necessary if things are getting out of hand, which I do not anticipate they will. We have in this space mutual respect for differing opinions. We recognize that this county is made up of folks with diverse opinions, perspectives, and backgrounds, and we really wanna honor that here today. I ask for folks to seek to understand before being understood themselves, 
and bringing that into the space in their commentary. The last thing that I'll ask of folks is to practice grace and space. Let's recognize that honest mistakes are made. Let's also recognize that impact and intent are two different things and that we must respect the impact that words and actions have, even if we don't intend for them to. And so with consideration to that, I would like to open it up um, to any live comments or questions from community members. If you yourself haven't signed up to speak and would like to share your thoughts, simply raise your hand as it shows on the screen and you will be added to the list of speakers. If you're tuned in on Facebook, please transition over to WebEx so that you can go ahead and share your comments here as well. Before moving along um, and opening things up, I'll pass it on over to staff from the Civilian Oversight Commission to walk us through any additional other housekeeping items we may need to mention. Thank you. And again, if you would like to make a comment and you're unable to raise your hand, you can also send a chat to the host and we'll make sure that we get you on the list. And before we take our first comment, we have one announcement in Spanish. Buenas tardes. Si necesitas sus comentarios en español traducidos al inglés, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de empezar sus comentarios y un traductor le dará instrucciones antes de que comience. Gracias. Thank you. And the first comment will come from Julie Martinez. Julie, you're unmuted. Um, hello, thank you for this opportunity. I have a lot to say, can't say it all in, in two minutes, but just as a reference to the zoot suit, someone, uh, one of the speakers said that the police looked on. No, my family was part of LA at that time. The police didn't look on. They took part in the beating of Mexican citizens. Now, I'd like to raise some things about accountability and about trauma. I've been speaking up at COC meetings for quite some time since my grandpa, my it's grandson. So ridiculous. Hello? I'm sorry. My hello? Sorry, go ahead. Um, okay. sorry my, about I'm that. sorry about that. I heard someone else talking. Um, and it wasn't from my side. Okay, my grandson was murdered by sheriffs at a very simple routine traffic stop and um, uh, it has caused a tremendous amount of trauma to my family. More importantly, my daughter-in-law and my grandchildren have been continually harassed by the sheriffs. There's been multiple reports and we have follow, follow through with extensive reporting. However, the harassment continues and what the panel needs to understand is that what the sheriffs are doing is a very strong concerted effort to break our my family's will they do things by like driving by they laugh they roll their windows down they use their hands to utilize their gang their deputy sheriff gang symbols they mock the community they follow our family around and it what I'd like to express is that the trauma never ends because the harassment doesn't end. And these sheriffs understand that there is zero accountability for what they do. They are not held accountable for their actions. The, the sheriff deputy who murdered my uh, grandson was also identified as one of the bandito gang members. And he is continue, he continues to work in East LA. He continues to harass our family. Um, this harassment causes trauma. It is real. Uh, my family has sought out counseling, but it's difficult to repair. It is extremely almost impossible to be able to heal from this when the harassment continues day after day. Uh, these sheriffs need to be held accountable. I understand that this panel does not control the issue of qualified immunity, but until qualified immunity is ended and until the sheriffs who commit these crimes against our community are held accountable, this will continue. And any help that the COC and this panel can provide is would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing in the space and for your comments, Julie. I do want to let you know that your sentiments are shared uh, not only with the Human Relations Commission, but 
definitely the civilian oversight uh, commission has taken a strong stance against the deputy gangs and are inching at ways to really make a difference on that front. Um, I also want to lift up to your point about qualified immunity, getting us closer to this place that we call justice. We recognize that as a need in the human relations commission and have recommended for an end to qualified immunity as well. And we will continue the efforts needed to move that along too. So thank you for raising that into the space as well. Julie really appreciate your time today. Jennifer. Thank you. And the next comment will come from John J. John, you are unmuted. Uh, Please go ahead with your comment. Hi, Wendy. How can parents help their kids with their trauma? When? Uh, yeah, so I think that it depends on what type of trauma the child is experiencing, but you know, there are a lot of programs out there, especially for children, um, you know, if they're involved with, if they're like enrolled in the public school district, there are uh, individualized educational plans, but they can be uh, done along with the therapist to really focus on the child's needs. Um, and there are a lot of agencies around too that can really focus on, you know, not only just the needs of the child, but also collectively the family. So there are a lot of wraparound services that can help with case management needs, um, along with mental health as well. Thank you for sharing that, Wendy. And I think one of the, I, I really appreciate the question. I believe um, the speaker's name was John Jay, right? Um, you know, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think for for me as, as somebody coming from uh, Pacoima and having dealt with uh, the trauma that I dealt with, uh, also having dealt with police misconduct as a kid, um, you know, I often felt that parents, they, they try to name their child's trauma based on their own lived experience. Uh, so something that parents can do is really try to come into the conversation uh, without bringing their own definition of what trauma is and really listening into the child um, and what, what the child is saying, um, what they're feeling and value that, if, even if it goes beyond the parent's understanding um, of, of trauma or understanding of how an experience can lead to that. Um, so I think it, it definitely begs for parents to keep that open mind um, and to keep an open perspective because times are changing and the ways that our youth are impacted uh, by the intersectional forces at hand is something that's very critical. Uh, Pastor Smith, would you like to bring anything into the space with respect to uh, how the parents can support their, their youth? Thank you for the opportunity. I think you hit it right on the nose, allowing the child the opportunity to actually express his or her concerns and be able to feel free to speak and talk. Um, it's very important that they get a chance to really express what their concerns are about law enforcement and to speak it in, in a way that, that they feel that they're uninhibited. If whatever their concerns are, however frustrating or however challenging it might be, give them that opportunity to speak. Um, I would also just, you know, give the advice of allowing of, I guess, watch also what they're watching on television, watch what they're listening to um, on the radio, because all of that can add to it. The media has such a powerful impact on the minds of our young people that we talked about, and I think Wendy talked about it earlier, about the media sensationalism. Uh, that unfortunately leaves an indelible impact in the minds of our young people, and they can literally carry that and and, and literally have an impact in terms of them being able to move forward. So give them the opportunity to speak uh, at any time and then allow them to come out, come forth and be truth of what their own, let, allow them to come forth to be truth of what their own truth is, allow them to speak it uh, uninhibitedly. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Pastor to... Jennifer. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Wendy. You were mentioning. No, yeah, I was just going to say really quickly is just also recognizing the generational trauma that if we, you know, are raised with parents that have a hard time talking about emotions or what's going on, or we don't have the emotional language to talk about what's what we're feeling, then it makes it hard to encourage our children to do that. So it's important like as parents to like develop the skills with our children and create that safe environment, which becomes a corrective experience for both the parent and the child. 100% and thank you for bringing that up Wendy as well. Um, in, in my situation, my mom 
came from the Salvadorian Civil War, uh, coming to this country with a fair amount of biases around um, the United States and uh, occupying forces and whatnot, and that gets passed down. So I think that that's something that's critical too, is the generational aspect of this all. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer, I wanna go ahead and pass it on to you to invite our next speaker over. Sure, Joseph Mayeslich, your mic is unmuted. Please go yes. ahead, Joseph. Um, Hello, and uh, my thanks to the, the hosts and speakers and to the commission for the series, the many kind of town halls and meetings like this they've had. We just heard the pastor talk about listen to the children, not to say that the community is all the children, but the more listening, uh, same thing for the work of the Human Relations Commission uh, with uh, getting people acquainted with each other, big help. I'm a marriage and family therapist with a specialty in trauma myself, and I appreciate Ms. Blanco's remarks about uh, self-care and, uh, and, and dealing and facing up to dealing with stress. And that brings me to a subject that, um, you, you know, it, the community is being abused, but I, I also uh, hear the phrase police abuse. What I mean when I say police abuse is abuse of the police by equipping them with the wrong equipment, the equipment that the community really doesn't need most, the wrong training and putting them in a position of dealing with on the on the margin right in between the great and growing inequalities uh, that there there exist the lack of services and the lack of people's ability to purchase their own services even the extreme economic differences that must be demoralizing for the police and i imagine some share of their misbehavior and uh, their breakdown under stress, which is the way I interpret a lot of the gangs that were referred, referred to by Julie and um, other, other behaviors are desperate behaviors of traumatized people who are being stuck in a wrong situation that they're not truly prepared for. Um, they're, they're stuck with a need to, I guess, orders to, to repress, to substitute for the services uh, that the community really needs. And so that's what um, that's a big thing that we're dealing with. It's hardly spoken about much more in the last couple of years of getting the appropriate services in there and the police out of there for situations that they're not prepared to handle. But not enough talk about dealing with the extreme inequality. That's a frustration and a chronic stress to community members. Um, of, of all kinds, but especially, of course, the most oppressed communities. And so while while these skills of self-care and mutual care and listening are very, very important, and they're things that we, even as individuals and small groups can do, uh, I think we ought to emphasize, and I ask the commission also to tell the supervisors and everybody else that the best, you know, the best relief of stress would be to reduce that cruel situation and of course get the, you know, that that the police uh, think they're commissioned to deal with it when they have the wrong equipment thank you thank you for sharing that joseph and you're correct hurt people hurt people in fact that is that is very true um panelists would you like to share anything Joseph, you're making a lot of great points, you know, that there is a lack of understanding of trauma and, you know, how it's, um, I thought about what we said earlier, like, you know, it's not encouraged even for officers to say that they're traumatized, right? It's not, again, it's sort of this um, good old boy uh, tradition um, within these like male dominated fields. So it's discouraged to ask for help. It's discouraged to say that you can't handle something. Right. So, um, so I agree with you 100% that it needs to be like the conversation needs to be different. Um, and we need to address that, that, you know, as Pierre said, hurt people hurt others. And so not having the training or the skills um, and then, you know, being put in situations that you're not trained for, you know, dealing with a mental health um, crisis is not what they're trained for, right? And so how do we create systems that address what is needed in real time rather than, um, rather than uh, deploying police officers for 
other things, you know, that, you know, social workers can be deployed for um, and how community, you know, collective community um, can also like step in when needed for different things. So I definitely think the conversation needs to be needs to go in that direction. Thank you, Ms. Blanco. Uh, Jennifer, can you invite in the next speaker? Sure, Paulette Dunn Sanders. You are unmuted. Oh. Please go ahead with your comment, Paulette. Oh wow! Well, I didn't realize I pushed raise my did I raise my hand? When when you had signed up, you check marked the button that you wanted to make a comment. Do you want to make a comment okay. and pass it along? No, absolutely. I'll make a comment. No problem. Okay, Hi, please go everyone. ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Paulette Dunn Sanders. I've experienced many um, incidents with police officers conduct and, um, you know, just my whole life, just in it within the community and then experiencing it with my own two sons. My youngest son experienced um, contact with law enforcement by being bullied by six other young boys and he ended up being the victim uh, and being expelled from being bullied. Then my oldest son was released uh, on his last day of probation, was picked up at the probation department for a, a, a falsified story, put back in jail for 22 years and a million dollar bill. And it's just been crazy. And I know he's a part of that gang um, that's going on with the police officers. Somehow they entrapped him and, and initiated whoever they needed to initiate to reincarcerate my son. Um, my thing is, I know all officers aren't bad officers, but for those that, that want to protect the serve our communities that we pay to do so to um, rather fault them, come up with a better solution to uh, um, engage our communities and our law enforcement that wants to, uh, uh, you know, be positive law enforcement, have a positive relationship. Usually young boys and girls want to be police officers when they're young. But when they see that these officers are doing bad conduct and misconduct activities, it, it really just started a whole nother thing. So um, I'm more about solutions. Uh, I understand that the, the bad officers do need to be accountable for the things that they have done. And I totally agree with all the uh, people on here that suffered from law enforcement activity, wrongdoings. It's not right. We pay them to protect and serve us. And it's just, a, it's, it's just crazy. So um, thank you guys for letting me share. And um, hopefully we can get to a, a better solution. Thank you. Thank you for sharing Ms. Dunn Sanders. Uh, and you, you bring up a very great point. Um, which is really the need to end over policing and under protection in our communities. Oftentimes we talk about how our people in, in our communities, black and brown bodies are often over criminalized. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we don't often hear how we're under protected. And that is one of the things that you very much highlighted through this unfortunate story um, of bullying really. You know, when one is a victim of bullying and then ends up becoming a victim of police abuse uh, when they're asking for help. I'm wondering if Pastor Smith can uh, just touch base on that and, and share uh, his thoughts and comments on that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Paulette, for sharing that with us. Um, what I'm realizing just from a community perspective is the idea that we may need to go back and I think we should go back to that old time policing and that old time policing was really when the police officer actually got a chance to know people in the community. It's not just riding in the car. It's not just policing the neighborhood, but it's more actually getting out and actually talking to the young people so that they know exactly who these young people are. And we have worked towards that in, in, in the Antelope Valley. We haven't reached the apex of it yet, but we're striving towards that, that we're not just 
uh, having uh, meetings with, 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 with law enforcement just to talk, uh, to have vain talk, but really to find out who that individual is and, and why that individual feels the way that individual feels. For, from a community perspective, uh, what we try to have law enforcement realize is that when we see you, all we see is a badge, a gun, and authority. So there is no trust there, there is no communication there, there is no relationship there. And at some point we've got to reach to the point where we can actually uh, stop the uh, uh, monologue and engage in more dialogue so that the officers can get to know us and we can get to know them because we're not just in the community just to be policed, but and policing is certainly important, but we wanna to get to know the police officer and the officer needs to get to know us as well. So it goes back earlier, Pierre, to, uh, Pierre, to what you talked about understanding, that we understand each other, we understand their role and that they begin to also understand our role. And the only reason why I say that is that I had that experience of tra uh, um, traveling with the police officer, you know, uh, being in their police car, going on a patrol with them and recognizing some of the dangers that they face um, but I don't think it has been reversed where officers actually come into our community and actually see some of the things that we see and some of the things that we experience. I think that's where the understanding breakdown takes place. And I think that's where we need to begin to have more of a, of a, of a, of a dialogue with each other. Uh, and I think that's what Paulette's children unfortunately face when that officer didn't know them and the bullying that they faced, that they had to face. And it's difficult to have a young child, a young uh, son, you know, released from prison and then find uh, ultimately going back into the prison. That's a frustrating process. But if that police officer had an understanding of who that individual was, they possibly can avoid the criminal justice system. And I know that that can happen because it's happened out in Antelope Valley. Thank you, Pastor Smith. Um, Ms. Blanco, would you like to share any thoughts? Yeah, just one thing that just came to mind um, as we were talking, Pastor, is this idea that you know, folks that are disempowered, you know, are um, sometimes uh, get into roles where there is like power, right? So that, like, I think that especially in Los Angeles, we do see uh, like a, a representation of people of color in law enforcement, right? Because there is that dream of like giving back, right? But but there are there is that essence of like people that are disempowered are going to revel in that power as well. Right, because that is what we do when we feel disempowered from childhood. We sort of then, um, you know, there can be like abuse of that power on the other end because we've never had it. Right, so I think that there is more understanding and more. I think is that disconnection, that lack of empathy when there is vicarious trauma within different fields, like first responders. There is that under empathizing of others because it keeps them. Um, sane in some ways right but also looking at like what how can we redo things to make sure that there is support on all ends you know and that make sure like as what you said pierre um under protection right really focusing on that and how to change that how to create uh, moments where there is more connection and in la you know it's hard because we're a huge there is a lot of you know, uh, almost a saturation of like of the, our population, right? And so in Antelope Valley, it's like a little bit different where, you know, there is more of that um, reach and, you know, and so thinking about like, how do we equip more, you know, relationships? How do we build more relationships? What can we do? What is the capacity that we have? Thank you, Ms. Blanco. And Jennifer, would you queue up the next speaker, please? Sure, Jacqueline Waite. You are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment, Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Jackie. Oh, you can call me Jackie. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I also do not have all of the answers, but I do believe that we uh, really need to demilitarize our community. We do not need more policing. We do not need to continue to uh, overly inflate the budget towards policing and militarizing the community. Just within the past four decades alone, the prison, the American prison population has increased over 500%. And the, the criminal justice system is a huge system 
of profit for big corporations. They make huge profits off of mass incarceration. And the whole system is very um, unjust. And uh, I just believe that we really need to stop throwing violence at, to, as an answer to our problems. These are real people with real problems and there doesn't seem to be enough or any accountability, um, especially with um, the over policing of BIPOC communities and other uh, issues that the community faces. And I just am not seeing the justice, any real justice, because if there is justice, George Floyd would still be alive today. People like Breonna Taylor would still be alive today. That is what justice would be. And we right now, as a community, we are just asking for the bare minimum, minimum from the criminal justice system and asking for accountability. Um, and so um, I'm not really sure, again, what are the solutions. And uh, I definitely do not have all of the answers. And I know the commission does not have the power um, to do everything that we ask, but I do want to emphasize that we do not need more policing and that we should be asking to shift funds from the military, from the police to programs that serve the community and serve real problems. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Jacqueline, and really lifting up, you know, I think something that that is critical. Uh, this was accountability that this isn't justice as it should be served in that sense. Um, I was wondering if any of the panelists would like to share any of their thoughts in regards to this. With, so, with their, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Pierre. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I actually totally agree. I, I think, uh, I think Jackie hit it on the nose in terms of over policing. Um, and I think the funds that are going towards a lot of police uh, budgets uh, is, is an exaggeration. I think some of those funds could be utilized uh, for communities uh, that are working to try to create more conflict resolution programs that are working with our young people that are working to heal some of the trauma that's taking place in our community. And I think there needs to be more of an effort towards uh, working to see if how we reallocate those funds. I want to encourage Jackie also just to not give up. Um, I, I know the frustration. I hear the pain. Um, and I know that you indicated, you know, you don't have all the solutions. Certainly the commission doesn't have all the solutions, nor we. But I do know that when we come together collectively and work uh, and sincerely put our mind together, we can really come up with solutions to bring about change. And so I don't want us to forget, yeah, this commission does have some authority and I have all the authority that it, that it, that it desires, but you also have authority. You have the ability to reach out to elected officials. You have the ability to organize in your community to help change laws because your voice matters. And so I wanna encourage you to keep doing that, continue to find out uh, how much money is being allocated in your uh, your community with respect to your sheriff's department and connect with your county board of supervisor as well as your elected officials to make a change and make a difference. Thank you, Pastor Smith. Um, if Wendy doesn't have any comments, then I would just uh, call on Jennifer to bring up the next speaker. Sure. Steve Hill, you are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comments, Steve. Hey, good, every, good afternoon to all. Um, first off, is this being recorded? Yes, Steve, it's being recorded and uh, Facebook Live as well. And, and, and it's Facebook Live. Okay, just, just quickly, if, if somebody can answer this, what is, what is the job of this commission? Jennifer or Chair Rubin, would you like to take that on? You guys wasted my time. 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't have an objection to that, but I, I I would like some more information from the speaker, um, and then I'm happy to answer the question. Okay, okay, great. Listen, and Jesse, you know what I'm going through. What I'm going through with the sheriff's department should be a case study, a case study on why black people hate dealing with law enforcement. Now, I'm, I'm a former US Marine. I'm also a retired correctional officer. I had the money to pay for an attorney. This incident of bullying by the sheriffs happened to me before, before George Floyd was murdered. And I still don't have a hearing yet. This is a case study. This is what's wrong with the system. My attorney, I'm sure, is in on it. This is how broken the damn system is. I'm not even close to getting a hearing. And it's the big fat game they play and nobody's doing nothing about it. Jesse, man, I, I am really hurt that you're not helping me with this. This is, this is ridiculous. And I was a candidate for state Senate. You're talking about reaching out to your uh, elected officials, man. I've talked to Tom, Scott, Mike Garcia, Christy, Every, everybody that's running, I've talked to them about this and can't nobody do a damn thing. And this is, this is also layered, just to make it perfectly clear, this is also layered with, with a religious element because that's why the deputy came to my house. Luckily, I took a picture of him. And then everything I've tried to do, I started out initially just wanting to talk to Captain Schaefer to let them know, hey, you need to train your deputies. Don't be doing this shit. And nothing. I was ignored. This is a case study of why we hate the damn police. They can't be trusted. I got them caught in several lies. They're, it's embarrassing. I have them caught in several lies. And I can't even get a hearing. This is humiliating, frustrating, and disgraceful. And I implore this commission to look at what the hell a black man has to go through. And I live to tell about it. Thank you. Uh, P, um, Pierre, if I could just respond briefly. Um, um, I'm going to ask one of our staff members to reach out to Mr. Hill and um, uh, try and assist and get information from him. That's one of the many things that we do. Awesome. Thank you, Chair Rubin. And and for context, um, if, if you can just take like a, a quick 30 seconds to a minute to just explain um, what the commission is about, just to answer the initial question. Sure. Um, what, what the commission does is um, we are set up to... Um, monitor to um, serve as a liaison between the community and the sheriff's department. Um, we seek transparency, accountability. We propose uh, policy changes um, to the sheriff's department. We also, as most people know, now have the power of subpoena. Um, so that's, we have a, we have a broad portfolio of many things that we can do. And we certainly try and assist members of the community um, uh, with, with specific issues if we can. Thank you, Madam Chair, for sharing that. And thank you, Mr. Hill, for logging on and taking the time to share your story and your energy. You know, I, I think one thing that I'd be remiss to say is that it takes a lot of strength and courage for you to do what you're doing and not only what you're doing in the courtroom, but also just putting yourself out there in these public forums. Oftentimes we talk about the trauma that we face and the effects of that trauma, but we don't really talk about how organizing in this space, speaking for oneself and really trying to be a voice for folks who are often voiceless is often re-traumatizing to ourselves. And, you know, I, I do want to just, you know, tip my hat off for you in that sense, um, because I, I feel that oftentimes uh, that doesn't get recognized enough. Uh, the labor that you're doing is emotional labor, and we appreciate the fact that you're willing to spend that time to share with us and see what we can do to not only find resolutions, 
to your current experiences, but also tie this into the liberation of all black and brown folks and all people in this country and world. So I appreciate that. Jennifer, would you like to bring on uh, the, oh, go it, ahead, uh, yeah, Pastor I'm Smith. Sorry. Yeah, please, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I do know Mr. Hill and I did want to respond to his uh, concerns and I, I certainly know some of the frustration that he is going through and, and he's gone through it on, along with a number of other people in the community. And I, and I say to him and I say to so many others that unfortunately justice doesn't come overnight, that unfortunately justice seems very long and it is a perennial struggle to try to get justice in the criminal justice system and in the courtroom. I'm glad he's retained legal counsel and I'm not sure what the legal counsel is doing for him, but I do know that if you do uh, continue to maintain and push for justice, that it can happen, that you don't give up, that you don't get frustrated and feel like nobody can help you. I'm so happy to hear that uh, somebody from this commission, in fact, will be reaching out to you, um, but don't lose hope and don't lose faith. Uh, justice will come in your corner. It will come at a time when you least expect it. And I know we've been indoors for a night, but I do believe justice does come in the morning. So I want to encourage Mr. Hill to continue to hang in there. And anybody else who's been waiting for justice and fighting for it, that's a trauma in and of itself, just trying to figure out when is it going to come? How is it going to come? Why is it taking so long? And sometimes it can wear you out. But I am of the opinion, coming from the pastoral point of view, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. I do believe that God is a God of just, and that if you continue to stay focused and continue to, in the pursuit of getting justice for yourself and others in our community, it will happen. Thank you, Pastor Smith. Ms. Blanco, would you like to make any points? Yeah, I was just thinking about who are a lot of the survivors that we, you know, that we see are uh, sexual assault survivors and we think about how justice, you know, um, hasn't ever really come easy uh, to our survivors, you know, many actually don't see any justice um, in the legal system. And so I think of them too, and, um, and just thinking about how sometimes justice comes from that, that emotional uh, process of healing, um, in our inner strength, right? Like like healing um, internally. And so I think that that's not the best answer because it feels bad, you know, that we can't get the legal justice that we, that so many of our survivors deserve. But at the same time, you know, that is important to continue to fight for policy change, to continue to fight so that it is, it makes it smoother for the next folks to, to fight for justice, right? And so I think that when we think of it, like our justice, it feels so futile and it's hard to hold space for it, but also thinking about justice can look differently for everyone and we're building, we're, we're creating these stepping stones. Thank you, Ms. Blanco. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to bring on the next speaker, please? Sure, John Sanford. You are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment, John. Hi, good afternoon or good evening. Um, so, so the same with what the previous gentleman said regarding the uh, COC. <clears throat> One thing that I've been noticing is this love-hate relationship with the sheriff's department. Um, you guys keep on bringing motions up, bringing appeals up, bringing certain things up, but I've never seen anything pass, anything come to fruition. One thing that I would like to recommend is um, raising the educational requirement. Uh, Villanueva supposedly raised it from a, from a high school diploma to an AA. Um, I don't understand where in the county someone with the AA could make close to an average of 86,000 uh, working as a sheriff, also making overtime, <clears throat> sometimes making over 200,000. Whereas a teacher, a public school teacher with a teacher's credential starts working at at least uh, 47,000 a year. Uh, there has to be, you. I don't know, there has to be an educational uh, requirement higher than an AA. Uh, a BA, a BA, something in sociology, something in social work, something in humanities, because it's obvious that these officers that are maining and killing people are lacking that. They, they have, 
I don't know. It's like they hire these officers that lack a compassion uh, that can't even take the moment. For, like, for instance, Isaiah Cervantes, who was shot in the back, who is an autistic person, has a mentality of a six or seven year old. And they told him beforehand with the deputies that showed up, they told him that. And they still went and arrested him, detained, you know, try to put handcuffs on him. Just the mere fact of being touched by someone that, that he doesn't know is going to cause for him to react the way he did. So I don't understand how, you know, the, the, the requirement of an educational, you know, it's so, it's so low. AA? No, it's ridiculous. It's, so I would suggest for you to talk to Villanueva and to raise at least the requirement because the deputies that are out there right now, they're not doing a great job. I wish that they could be, you know, the department could be abolished and whatnot, but it's obviously that you guys are not going to do that. And, but at least raising the requirement for these deputies to be more humane towards people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanford, for sharing that recommendation and lifting that up. Um, I definitely uh, want to just also uplift that there have been uh, some studies released in regards to this too, and just looking at uh, uses of force um, and comparing that to an officer's education as well, and uh, how how there is a connection and a correlation there. So thank you for bringing that into the space. Um, do any of our panelists want to share any of their thoughts in regards to this? Yeah, thank you, John, for sharing. I think you make a lot of excellent points. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder too, like if the money or the budgets are higher for things that we as a uh, maybe not as a society, but as leaders, you know, they value certain things more, right? Like social workers don't make a lot of money, you know, historically, right? So thinking about like putting money, you know, where we see value is really important and recognizing you know, why isn't, you know, there are more funds available for the services that are needed, right? And so I think that you make all these great points of like, if there was only more, you know, education around um, de-escalation um, and more information around, you know, mental health. Um, there would be a lot of situations that could be avoided or um, so I, you know, I thank you so much for, for bringing that topic up. That's just what came to mind for me. Thank you. Pastor Smith, do you have any comments? Only that I totally agree with John. I think it's so important for there to be a higher educational level for an individual that carries a gun and has a badge and has authority to take uh, life and, 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 and arrest folks. Uh, the quick decisions that they have to make um, and only having a high school diploma or uh, AA degree, I think, uh, requires more. And so I totally agree with John. I, I would work and I, I will be working towards efforts to, to push towards efforts to make that happen. I think that's a very, very good point. Um, yes, um, Pierre, if I could just uh, add something at this point, um, there certainly is a very strong um, countywide community effort to um, remove law enforcement responding to situations where there are clearly mental health and or disability issues, and um, the commission is very much involved with that. So um, we look forward to those kinds of changes. I mean, while I don't disagree with an educational requirement, an educational requirement is not equal to somebody having empathy and somebody understanding what it is that um, somebody with mental health issues or um, developmentally um, developmental disabilities um response to and experiences so um we are we are very much involved with that as our leaders within la county thank you for bringing that up chair rubin that is definitely important the alternative crisis response framework that's being developed 
um, will definitely be limiting the amount of interaction that sheriff's deputy have with community, especially uh, for our folks who are dealing with developmental and mental health challenges. I'll pass it back over to Jennifer to lead in our other speaker. Sure, and next up we have Cassandra Vanterpool. You are unmuted, please go ahead, Cassandra. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Cassandra. And um, I understand that this uh, commission is in regards to what's happening with LA County deputy sheriffs and uh, all the all the deputy sheriffs from, from LA, LA County, which would mean Antelope Valley and Santa Clarita and so forth and so on. But um, what I wanted to address, um, if I may make a segue, have you have you ever thought about having a commission uh, regarding the entrance exam of the candidate, which in turn involves a 500 question questionnaire that everybody's familiar with because if their if their parents or their father their sister or their brother haven't told them how to answer this 500 uh, um, questionnaire psychological questionnaire you now that they, they know how to answer those but i think it needs to be deeper than that and um before we had Yahoo, I don't know what they were looking at before we had any social, social, uh, you know, uh, uh, speaking, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, avenues, then we really didn't know that much about that person and what they are actually thinking. Well, nowadays, uh, the candidates are smart enough to delete anything that would send up a flag that they're not really, they shouldn't even be a, considered a candidate. So in the investigative process of this candidate there should be not only an, well, an extension of their family and what type of uh extended family is is you know what what do they have that are flags that should be that are raised and so in considering that then this person if they're in close connection with this particular family member or members that's be something to be investigated before considering that candidate to go any further, whether it's about the 500 questionnaire, uh, mental health questionnaire, or any other questions. And um, I just, you know, for me, it's before any of that's decided as a candidate, those measures should be in place and be enforced and be in place. But that that's for not this season that we're going through. This is for the new deputies or, or candidates that are trying to come in to try to nip that in the bud before we get, you know, sour apples that are involved and and turn out to be just like some of these uh, abusive um, deputy sheriffs that are out here. So I, I just have that to say that we need to look deeper um, into the future. This is now we can do what your commission is, allows you to do, but we need to set up another commission in, in involving federal investigation or staying in touch with the FBI, whatever it is that it takes to weed out that bad apple, we need to do it. We need to do it. And I'm just, I'm so saddened by all of this. Uh, just the other day, uh, my husband sat on his key fob, uh, alarm key fob, and I, you know, I, it, the sound went off. But I didn't know what it was because I had never touched the panic button on our alarm system. Well, my husband and the person that was with him, they left. And I'm sitting still in the, in the formal living room. And I hear this voice coming from outside in the courtyard. So I get up and I look. And there is to the, on the left side where the, where the side of the house is. When you open the door, my door opens from, my screen door opens from right to left. Okay, she was on the left side. And I looked and her, she didn't have her hands on her holster, nothing, you know, just standing there. And then I looked to the right and there's that, um, I forget what it's called. It's a column that supports the little porch, like to keep you from the rain when you're in that enclosure right there. Mm -hmm. Well, this gentleman, this officer, I didn't even, all I saw was wrists, two wrists, two hands locked together with a Glock, a 45 in his hand. 
And I'm like, what's what's going on? Yes. So he said, we're here, you know, investigating a, a panic alarm. And I said, what, you know, what panic alarm? So anyway, to make a long story short, um, are you okay? And I said, sure. Um, can you open the door, please, so I can see who you are? In the meantime, that Glock had slipped back into the holster. I don't uh, remember seeing that. And so um, he op I opened the door yeah. and he says, can you give me your name? I'd like to know, yeah, can you open the door? Cassandra. You are? Yes. Sorry, I'm Cassandra. We, we 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 just have to ask if you can just to kind of curb end the story right now if possible just because okay. we've gone over the, the three minute I've, time I apologize. Frame. I, no worries. Thank you for still. sharing. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it, Cassandra. Um, I think you you bring up a very important points about really looking at how we can have trauma-informed performance evaluation metrics for law enforcement, as well as how we can integrate trauma-informed approaches when we think about our recruitment and our hiring within the Sheriff's Department. And these are things that are very pivotal in looking into and starting to develop a knowledge base on. And so I'm confident uh, some of the folks that are working around trauma prevention and intervention at the county level, as well as at our community level over at Peace Over Violence um, can really shed some light onto this as we move forward. Um, I'm gonna ask Jennifer to bring in our next speaker. Sure, William Jackson, you're unmuted. Please go ahead, William. Hello, my name is William Jackson. I'm a first responder. I've been a nurse over 23 years. And um, I would say back on uh, January 4th of uh, 2018, um, I worked a shift out at Western Anaheim Medical Center, um, which is now formally formerly well now it's called orange county global medical center um i drive a cls 550 mercedes benz and um one night after we had got off work um a co-worker of mine asked if i could give her a lift home uh, she was staying in at a sister's house in the area of compton um, so, um, we stopped at a Jack in a box off the, off of a uh, central and, um, I believe it was, uh, um, either a or a Rosecrans. I, I can't remember. Uh, but, um, when we left the Jack in a box, uh, she, I had to make a U-turn and turn down this side street, which was extremely narrow. Uh, in fact, so narrow that um, so narrow that uh, two cars, uh, it would be impossible for them to pass each other. Uh, when we pulled on the street, we saw uh, sheriff deputies uh, involved in a traffic stop. The patrol car was uh, staggered to the vehicle that they had pulled over. Um, this was an extremely long street, and the only way to maybe decide to go in the other direction would have been to pull into the driveway and then turn around. It would have required a lot of m maneuverability. Uh, long story short, uh, and I certainly didn't want to attempt to try and pass the sheriff deputies while they were engaged in the traffic stop because of their vehicle being staggered in the street with their doors open um, on both sides. It, it would have been um, I just, my better judgment, uh, told me that if I attempted to do something along those lines, um, it would not end well for me. So I patiently, uh, we both sat there in the car and let them complete their traffic stop at a reasonable distance, maybe about 150 to 200 yards back, literally. And, um, <laughs> immediately after the traffic stop, you, we saw the vehicle drive off. And we saw the patrol car still sitting there. So at by then we just decided, you know what, let's just go the other way. You know, um, who if if they think that we're suspicious for sitting here and waiting for them to drive off, 
then you know oh well what are, we're nurses like what we got i have my stethoscope sitting right and, in and william view. i don't mean to interrupt but your time has um expired so if you'd like to make any concluding remarks now would be your time um the police r ran up on me and my coworker with guns to our heads blocked us in and the cops, one of, I, I was terrified. He gave me commands that w were didn't make sense. Um, he wanted me to get, show my wallet, but he wanted me to keep my hands up. I'm in nursing scrubs. Most men keep their wallet in their right rear pocket. I was afraid to grab my wallet because the gun was literally inches from my face. Um, these types of situations happen too many times, uh, and they have an attitude, which I've seen in the hospital, of an us versus them mentality. They consider you an us when they see you in your professional capacity um, at the hospital in, while they're in the substation in the hospital. But when we're out in the public, uh, as a minority, you're just another minority and they really don't care how they treat you. Um, a way for that to change, a significant way for that to change would be not just the educational requirements uh, with the background in social studies, but a significant change would bring come about if the requirement for deputy sheriffs would primarily be that they live in the zip code that they police. If Thank these you for officers that, Thank you. live Thank you. in the same zip code, then I guarantee you they'd have skin in the game. They'd Thank have a personal- Thank you, William. Appreciate that, William. Appreciate you bringing that into the space as another recommendation to consider as we push forward in this. Thank you for sharing your stories and uh, definitely apologize for any of that that incident that you um, had experienced. It's definitely something that I myself have found myself in, and I know it can be very traumatic. Uh, so thank you for sharing in the space. Um, Jennifer, would you like to bring in the next speaker? Yep. Next up, we have Monica Thomas. You are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment, Monica. Hi. I would just like to start. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we do. Okay. We do. Please go ahead. I would just like to recognize first, my hat still goes off to the sheriffs and other law enforcement agencies because they their job is tough, very tough for that matter. Um, but I too, I have sons, they're both black, um, young, one is six, five, 17. I have another one that's six, three. And I know for them, that's rather tall if they were to step out because most of them would be taller than your average officer. But I think it would be helpful. I know in my department, we have to take the implicit biases courses. And I think that would be helpful no matter what. If officers take that training, because when you come across people, and I think it's natural for people to have an automatic bias, and I'm not sure. Well, actually, I'm kind of sure, but I'm not sure why it is that. So many officers, and it's just not white officers that approach black males. I've seen it with Hispanic and Asians as well, just like those that are getting ready to go on trial after the with the after Shaban, however you pronounce his name, that seem to have this intimidation, that's what I call it, whenever they approach black males. So I think what the department should still do is have some type of implicit bias training for these officers, and again. I have a lot of respect for them because I'm a probation officer and, I, and uh, Ms. Rubin, I respect what you said and it makes a lot of sense because you can have all the education in the world. Anybody can be book smart, but you have to have some empathy when you're out there in the communities. And you have to know, I think Mr. Smith, that's what you were saying. You also have to know the people that you're working with, get out there and get to know them. So, um, it's good to have the education with the degree behind it, but again, you have to have empathy. You have to get out there to know the people. So the police do need to do a better job of that. But most importantly, again, being a mother of two black sons, and I'm hearing, I'm not hearing a lot of that 
from the panel being addressed because I am fearful and I too tell my sons and I work in this field though, but I still tell my sons, make sure your hands are on the steering wheel so that the officers can see it. They have mobile phones and I tell them, make sure you pull somewhere in the light. They are gonna hit the lights on you, go somewhere where it's lit. Make sure you turn on the record on your cell phones. But that's just the reality of a young black man in America. So again, Ms. Rubin, I respect everything you said about empathy. That's true. Mr. Smith, everything that you've said about going out there, getting to know the people in the community, that's true. And of course, you, I believe you gotta have some common sense along with Booksmart. Common sense is a key, believe it or not. And thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for sharing your insight as well as your recommendations. And I'm wondering if we could bring in um, Wendy into the space to just speak on um, how parents can really help uh, provide this information in a way that isn't fear-based, that really is centered on being trauma-informed as well. And just any additional tips that you might have or comments you might have to speak on uh, that point exactly that uh, Ms. Thomas most graciously presented to us. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for bringing that into the space. I think, you know, I uh, my heart hurts for every every time I hear that, you know, that we um, have to almost train our boys of color to act a certain way with with people that they should feel safe with. But like you said, it's the world that we live in. Um, and I think of, you know, um, I don't. I'm not really addressing your your question here, but I will get to it. I do think that it's understanding how systematic racism has created this to be the norm. You know, when I think about how, like, we look at colorism, and there are like, there's this really great um, YouTube video that shows how even early, uh, early on, children are asked. You know, they put two dolls in front of them, a white doll and a black doll, and they say, which one is good. And they choose the white doll. They say, which one is bad? And they choose the black doll. And it's, you know, they're all toddlers, right? And it's it's so painful to watch that at the end of that, they ask them, who do you most look like? And all the kids point, because they were all children of color, they all point to the black doll. And so we're also creating this, like, it's it's a norm that, like, that somehow we're responding um, in a this fight flight mode with you know people of color, and so and I also think that it's important to bring in sort of the anti blackness that exists. You know, we keep saying people of color too, but I think that when we consider like how many uh, black people are disproportionately affected by the justice system, right? Dis disproportionately in jails, you know, disproportionately affected by homelessness. You know, we also have to talk about that and we have to talk about how do we change that? How do we look to, you know, not just, you know, teaching uh, our young boys how to act in front of law enforcement, but also changing that um, what has become our norm. Thank you for that. Um, Pastor Smith, did you have any thoughts that you'd like to share? Just that I truly understand Ms. Thomas's point of view as a black man, despite my activity and my activism in the community, whenever I'm in, confronted by law enforcement in the Antelope Valley or LA or Santa Monica or anywhere, I still feel that cringe. I still feel a concern that uh, my mere color and the fact that I'm a male, uh, African-American male or black male in this country uh, represents a threat to law enforcement. And so it comes for me that until we're able to establish some kind of trust and accountability with law enforcement, I think black men uh, will always have that apprehension. Uh, and it is a trauma that I think travels deep. Uh, I talk to it about my daughters uh, and I talk to it about young black males out here in the community that uh, they need to be very careful how they interact with the police and don't even, it sounds crazy, but don't even give them cause to even try to pull you over or bring you, uh, or call you to the side. And when they do, you just maintain your confidence. Uh, that self-care that we talked about earlier, that Wendy talked about earlier is very important. 
that you make you want to make sure that you that you that you want to be able to live tomorrow and so comply what you need to comply with give them the information that they need that they need and then we'll be able to if uh, if if injustice occurs we'll be able to fight it another day so i i certainly relate to what Ms. thomas is saying and i encourage you keep talking to your children and keep giving them guidance in terms of what to do what to say and what not to say Thank you, Pastor Smith. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to bring in the next speaker? Yes, no, Monica Jones, you are unmuted. Please go ahead, no, Monica. Hi, um, I'm a, a mother of five black women, young women, and, and I have seven siblings, um, all, all black. We've all had um, experienced abuse from the police, including my mother and um, you know, I, I, like any other corporation that exists that has a bad rep, one thing that they do it, to change the, the way that people see them, to change their motto, is that they go away and they come back as something else. I, th I really feel that abolishing the police is the answer, and then they can come back as servants of the community um, in, in two different systems that deal with two different types of community issues, mental health and, um, um, you know, different um, nonviolent community issues, and then police that come, you know, to answer robberies or, you know, breaking and enderies, uh, enter, you know, two different systems, um, because we need to change the face of that organization. That organization started off by, you know, by catching runaway slaves. And that same anti blackness continues to exist within that system. But not only that system, plenty of other systems that are still, you know, that were created initially um, from a very uh, anti black, for a very, very anti black purpose. So a lot of these systems continue to, to exist and they have the same deep rooted anti black um, um, policies and 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 you know just their way of being and it continues to show in the way that they treat the community from Department of Children and Family Services to the to the police to um, even the Board of Supervisors. You know, they, they're not they're, They speak for the people, but the people don't truly have access to them. I've experienced trying to get things agendized on the for the, um, with the board of supervisors and I could not even get a single politician, a single office. Um, council member and otherwise to tell me, how do I get an issue that needs to be addressed in the community on the agenda for, you know, for, um. For the board of supervisors, that system needs to change as well, because if you have a, a whole system that's, you know, that is put together to address community concerns and needs and that's speaking for the community, they need to be more accessible. People in the community need to be able to access them, you know, and if there are barriers in the way of us um, being able to bring our issues to that to the board. Um, that ex you know what is it called the um, yeah. the bylaws their bylaws it, it doesn't you. have anything in there that says I know my time has run out um, but it, there's nothing in the bylaws nothing clear that that shows that there's a clear way for communities to bring concerns that that can be addressed formally in the public uh, on their agenda you know so that needs to change but there's so many other ways and I appreciate this platform thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ms. Jones, for bringing that up. And I think, um, you know, you, you brought up uh, more than two things, but two things really come to my mind. Um, really a recognition uh, to what Ms. Blanco was presenting on earlier, a recognition of the historical violence and historical trauma that has passed on through generations, which then also seeds that distrust um, within our own uh, communities of color and how they interact with law enforcement. Uh, so really there being a recognition of that history of violence is something that's important. And then going beyond, I think your ask for additional clarity and not just clarity, but accessible pathways to be able to provide community input. 
um, you know, this being the very floor in that sense and not the ceiling, these types of forums. And so really appreciate you bringing that into the space. Uh, Jennifer, I'd like for you to reach out and see if we can get uh, the one last, uh, I think actually we have two more people queued up, right? Yep, two more people. We'll first mm -hmm. hear, hear from Valerie Vargas. You are unmuted, Valerie. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm the auntie of Anthony Vargas, who was killed August 12, 2018, uh, by the East Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And, um, you know, we, we come on these boards pretty often, but I just wanted to, to kind of um, talk about what we had experienced on Sunday with the press conference and rally of Isaias Cervantes at the East Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And, um, you know, I hear callers calling in and I, you know, talking about bridging that gap of, of not of, of the community and the sheriff's department. And I hear, see you guys nodding when you guys agree that that LASD shouldn't shouldn't be called out to certain uh, uh, crisis calls. But like just last week, this board motion to give money to the sheriff's department to have more sheriffs into the Met department, into the Met team. But let me go back to like what had happened on Sunday. You know, we had this family who had called the Met team for help for their son. And when we arrived at the sheriff's station, this family was met with barricades. This family was met with about 20, 25 deputies in riot gear. You know, there was kids playing in the park. There was about four other families. There was a family of Paul Rea. There was a family of David Ardaz. There was a family of us. And there was there was a Cervantes family that were all re-traumatized. This there's this topic was supposed to be about trauma. Like we're constantly being re-traumatized. When this family arrived to do the press rally, they couldn't even have access to the ramps. There was people in wheelchairs. And the sheriff's department blocked it all off. You know, and the, these deputies were walking around with like CS ga gas launchers with their fingers like on the trigger. These there was also deputies holding like 44 millimeter foam round launchers. And within feet, there's kids playing. So like this family is being re-traumatized. So like, I don't understand how you guys wanna have, like you guys are, are interested in, in, in like, fitting the community's needs to have and, and like support and family assistance when you guys are giving LASD more money to have sheriffs in the MET team. Thank you, Valerie. You, you still have uh, about 20 seconds left. Did you want to make any final comments? I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it and bringing that into the space. We think that it's definitely something, um, you know, with, with the fact that, that we con constantly are asking, um, you know, your families for emotional labor. It's definitely something that for us to consider on how we can be more supportive of, of families that have experienced this violence. I know that uh, within the county right now, they're really looking at uh, pushing forward uh, the family assistance program, which has really been something that the Civilian Oversight Commission has also championed, but that came forth because of y'all's organizing out in the community, um, not only with the Youth Justice Coalition, but the various families of folks who are survivors um, of police abuse and violence. I wanted to uh, see if if um, any of our panelists just wanted to share some initial thoughts about uh, your comments. One thing that I did want to add is just kind of understanding that there are um, really, um, to your point, Valerie, it's like, you know, reinvesting that money into like support services that are much needed. Like, you know, I know that at Peace Over Violence, we're a trauma recovery center. So when someone comes to us and um, particularly around mental health, health, like mental health crisis. You're not need to get off. Can put this stuff under this table? Sorry about that. Please go ahead. So, um, particularly around mental health crisis, you know, we always are doing a safety plan with the family, right? We talk about like different ways um, to um, different ways to sort of target what's happening, right? With the help of community 
or organizations or our organization, what can we do together? Right? One of the things that I know that we have done is called like the psychiatric emergency response team, right? What happens with that is there aren't enough resources, right? So we end up, which we have done multiple times, we end up waiting in the office for eight hours for the pet team to arrive. So we're sitting with our client and we're, you know, we're trying to de-escalate the situation ourselves, right? But um, so here's another system issue is that there isn't enough of that mental health team that can come out and really assess what's going on. And so I really think so the fault is, um, is really the systems like they're not designed to for us to thrive in a sense. Sometimes I feel that way. Like as a social worker, there are so many barriers that exist in accessing services. And so I think that there is um, limited access. And also like, it would be nice if like the budgeting were sort of focused on the, the services that are really needed. The, like as Pierre talked about, like these programs that are really there to be alternate options you know, and have a community come together and to provide different options. But the things that are in place right now, and, you know, not just the sheriff's department, but also the mental health system um, in California has its issues. So I think even looking at collectively, like where are the issues really? And why are we always like funneling back to law enforcement instead of going to budgeting for programs like the pet team that actually are helpful but also are limited and at capacity. Thank you, Ms. Blanco. Jennifer, would you invite our final speaker for the evening? Sure, Joseph Huang, you are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment, Joseph. Wow, okay, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep, we do. Oh, great, I'm so happy to be able to speak. Um, I'm so excited to speak. Um, I just wanna tell you guys, please, don't spend any more energy making complaints and sharing your experiences. The one thing that we need is to have local elections for police chiefs, okay? And I, I know I'm gonna give you the solution right now, but I'll explain to you why. And I've done a lot of research on this, okay? So a lot of, a lot of times the police chief is being a, a, a assigned by the city manager or you know by the uh, council the city council or by the county board of the supervisors right but who do they get to choose from a lot of times they only get to choose from the people who are nominated and who gets to nominate the um actually the police union nominates who they can choose. And uh, just like in the last election, Alex Villanueva, he was the better choice of the two. But that was that's like choosing between tw Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, one historian said, um, I think it was William Tweed, said, it doesn't matter who you like for, I don't care who you like for, as long as I get to nominate. So, the nomination process is what we need to control. We cannot let the police unions tell us who we can choose as police chief. We have to allow ordinary citizens to come and participate and be, and be allow them to be elected as police chief. So as the commit so what I'm imploring the commission to do is to advertise and endorse elections for police chiefs and allow the public to participate, allow the public to participate in the election as candidates. And we need to do this not just on the county level or LA city level, but in every city, every small city, because you cannot have one person managing millions of people, okay? It has to be broken down by community. So each person here that is listening has to go to their city council and advocate the same solution. Don't share your experiences anymore. Advocate this solution, elections. Then we can talk, we can have a meeting, we can have a, 
uh, uh, a debate with those people. Okay, the commission, the committees all need to budget for this. I'll need to advocate for this as well. Thank you, Joseph. Because, Thank you, you and know, that does conclude and the, the police time. registry. Police registry will help identify who are the bad apples. So that Thank is you, the next step. That's all Thank I'm saying. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments and your recommendations, Joseph. Really appreciate that. Um, as we come to a close for our listening session, I'd like for us just to take a quick moment to be able to settle, settle our thoughts, settle our minds, settle our breath together. Um, we have heard from a lot of folks who have been sharing their pain, their trauma, their experiences, uh, their opinions and their beliefs based on their lived experience. And I really wanted to take a moment to honor that. If you can um, entertain this request, please, if you feel confident and, and um, able to, please close your eyes and take a quick second to just take a deep breath with me. On the count of three, I will count down for us to go ahead and take our deep breath in. Ready? One, two, three. Deep breath in. Breathe in that positivity. Breathe out the negativity. Thank you all for sharing here today. As you open up your eyes, please set your intention for the rest of the evening. I want you all to know that you all have been felt, heard, and seen throughout this conversation, that your words and the energy that you've spent are not falling on deaf ears, and that we, as representatives of the county, representatives of community organizations, and community members ourselves of beautiful LA County, are ready and willing and dedicated to do this work to continue seeing this through. I'd like to thank each community member for providing and sharing their experiences. And I'd like to thank our panelists here today, Ms. Wendy Blanco and Pastor Jesse Smith for sharing their wisdom, their knowledge and their expertise with us today. I'd like to, in closing, invite Pastor Jesse Smith from the Way Center of Truth to provide us his closing reflections and lead us into the end of our event today. Pastor Smith, you have the floor. Thank you very kindly, and I know time is of the essence. I want to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank Mr. Williams as well as Ms. Rubin and all of the panelists who are joined us this evening, and all of those who participated in this process. And I'm not sure if there were those who wanted to speak and didn't get a chance to speak, but I want to just thank you for being part of this whole process tonight. Trauma is real; uh, it it can carry some serious repercussions if it's not handled correctly. And so some of the strategies, some of the solutions, some of the recommendations you heard tonight, I would implore you to, to begin to apply them in your life. Meditation is so important. And I know that wasn't touched on a lot tonight, but meditation is so important. We do that in our church because we deal with trauma, whether it's from the police, whether it's from the government, whether it's from our own personal lives, we have to find time to meditate and collectively get our thoughts together. Uh, Ms. Blanco talked about self-care, and I think that's so important that you begin to set out, set out some time for yourself as an activist, as a leader, as one who may in fact be involved in the criminal justice system, fighting for a loved one. If you don't find time to really just uh, reflect and, and communicate and, and connect with yourself, you can find yourself exhausted in this process. Uh, there are some things that I've heard tonight that seem to carry a common theme, a common trend. One is definitely accountability. Another one is um, uh, transparency. But even the more important one, which I think is very critical, is trust. Uh, clearly, we lack an AT&T communication with the law enforcement, and it's time for us to begin to get back to that process. And we do it through raising our voice. Dr. King said, our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. Those of you who spoke tonight, clearly your voice matters. Your testimony about your feelings, your hurt, your pain, your concerns, your experience with law enforcement, it matters. You speak for those who have who have, the, who have been victims of unjustified police shootings and killings. I wanna reassure you tonight, your voice does matter. And not only does your voice matter, but your voice can bring about the change that we seek. Some of you gave great recommendations today. The commission took heed to them. I think that those recommendations and solutions are not only just gonna stop here, but that can actually be permeated in the community. So I wanna encourage you to keep doing that. Your voice can change the criminal justice system. If you speak loud enough, if you speak often enough, and if you speak with conviction, determination, and commitment. The, the, the guilty verdict, and we didn't talk much about it tonight, but the guilty verdict in 
uh, with Derek Chauvin um, uh, this uh, last week, I should say, uh, for me, that was uh, just a moment of inspiration and a moment of encouragement that, you know what, just like justice came in Minnesota, it can also come in Compton, California. It could come in Inglewood, California. It could come in Simi Valley and in the Antelope Valley. It means that we can't stop right now doing what we're doing. Let us celebrate that. I thank that I thank God for that verdict because it gives closure to the family, but even more importantly, it gives us just a small victory of what can happen when we organize as a community and we focus on the mental issues that's happening in our community with law enforcement and we don't stop. We have the opportunity to turn our frustration, our hurt, our pain into hope and inevitable change. And I wanna encourage all of you tonight to stay on that path. Somebody needs you to speak for them. Somebody needs you to advocate for them because here's the reality, the dead cannot talk for themselves, but the dead, they need you need to tell their story. And so you call, you're a call really for such a time as this. Don't get discouraged. Justice is not gonna come overnight, but I do wanna encourage you, justice will come if you remain persistent and continue by it. Let me close with this last statement as because I come from a spiritual background that my favorite book is in the book of Luke, the 18th chapter verses one through eight, that there's a widow that Jesus talks to his disciples about. And this widow is going to the judge and this widow is asking the judge for justice. And the judge just doesn't want to seem to give her justice. But Jesus closes this by saying, because the widow was persistent, because the widow was determined, because the widow kept going back to the judge over and over again, that judge turned around and said, I'm granting you justice because if I don't, you're going to drive me crazy. At some point, we need to keep doing what we're doing so we can drive those unjust officers in the in law enforcement. We need to drive them crazy right out of law enforcement. Those elected officials who are not adhering to what we need, we need to drive them crazy. That's how we get justice. I want to encourage you, stay on the path, stay focused, don't give up. We've been indoors for a night, but I guarantee you justice and joy, in fact, will come in the morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for those powerful words and that call to action, Pastor Smith. I feel it. Uh, can I pass this over to Madam Chair Rubin, who will be closing us out? Um, thank you, Pierre. Um, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Pastor Smith, for your insight, for your um, empathy, for your um, thought process. Um, it, this has been a very helpful and inspiring evening. And again, I thank all of the members of the public who spoke. Um, I think it was Pierre who said um, that many of them, most of them were very courageous to come forward and um, share their experiences. It is meaningful to those of us um, on the commission um, it helps enhance the work that we do. And um, Pastor Smith, you should know and members of the community should know that um, the commission does intend another program within the next couple of weeks, um, focusing on um, more specifically uh, the verdict in the George Floyd case and where we go from here in Los Angeles. So that is um, yet to be determined here. Um, but also, um, I want to remind all of you that the next meeting of the Civilian Oversight Commission is um, Thursday, May the 20th from 9 to 1 o'clock. I look forward to seeing all of you there to stay informed of upcoming community engagements hosted by the Civilian Oversight Commission and to register. Please visit our website coc.lacounty.gov. Once again, thank you to everyone. Have a good evening. And this closes our town hall. Thank you. Thank you.